This program is brought to you by Emory University. Um, and then today is the seat assignment day, right? As I sent you the thing to tell you that, right? Um, uh, so here is the sign-up sheet. I brought two of them, so we only have two shots at this. Okay? <laughs> we have to get this right on two takes. Let's see. Okay. So we'll start here, and we'll just pass it back and forth right so that I can read it. So you sort of have to see where you are and then turn it. That's what makes it hard. It's exciting that way, right? Okay. But I made it easy because I said, that's me. See, it's very clear. It's very clear. Okay. All right. So you are here. So you need to write your name like very neat to set the trend for everyone. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second is that we had that, the slide that I made to show how SARC works, which was screwed up, right, in the PowerPoint, um, mostly because the little white box was supposed to appear with the mutant version, but it didn't. So if you look at the PowerPoint that I posted, I added a new slide, right? I added a slide below there, and it says something clear like, I added this. Okay, that's what I called it, right? So it says, I added this, and, and hopefully that will explain to you. The, the key here is that the mutated version of SARC, the one that the virus was carrying, was deleted. The fancy first term is truncated. It was shortened, right? And it was missing a regulatory region. So that gene, that protein, was on all the time. Okay, that's the defect in SARC, right? It, it, it does the normal activity, but it does it all the time, okay? The presentation groups are on Blackboard. Uh, everyone should have gotten uh, an email from me this morning saying, here's your group. The email obviously has the members of your group. It's also on Blackboard uh, posted uh, with something. It's, I called it something like presentation groups. Okay, uh, So you can see there's a graphic in there uh, if you're not sure. Um, I'm, I'll write every group. I meet with every group at least one or two, well, at least twice, sometimes three or four times. I have a, meetings already this week with the first three. If you're in groups four or five, uh, then you should write me, uh, you should read the paper over the weekend, and you should write me to set up a time to meet next week. Okay? Four and five. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, you may have a link to a folder, and then you're all excited, and you like ran over there or whatever and did it, and then it was empty, and it was really disappointing. Sorry. Um, but they'll all be up there in the next day or two, right? All the, all the papers will be in there. And, and as we go along, I sort of add resources and other papers to your thing just to help guide you. Um, and this is your seat, so we know everything. We're all caught up, right? Okay. Questions? No. We're behind a little. I was thinking of just showing pictures and not saying anything today to make it go faster. Uh, but then I, I don't think that'll work. So, yeah. Right. OK. So viruses. Uh, this is where we left off. Uh, and, and what had been discovered up until this point was, and this is a different Steve Martin, not the comedian guy. Um, I was on a cruise in Alaska with this Steve Martin. He introduced himself, and I was like, could it be? God, it was him. Um, so, uh, so I met this dude. Nice guy. Um, so he worked with uh, temperature-sensitive mutants of uh, RSV. And so what did we say a temperature-sensitive mutant is? What does that mean? Someone's saying it. It functions at one temperature and not another. Typically, it is lower it works, higher it doesn't. Right? So, so it's a conformational change. Right? So the, it's just a stability issue, essentially, in the protein. And so what he found was that at the permissive temperature, uh, the, these cells that were infected with these mutants could both grow and transform. But when the temperature was raised to the restrictive temperature, such that that SARC wasn't working anymore, the cell acted normal again. And this is a very simple, to use an overused science term, elegant experiment, right? Very, very simple experiment. But it answered a, what turned out to be a pretty big question. And so the thinking is, if you're a normal cell, 
And, and we push this cell, making the changes that we talked about, to make it into an abnormal or cancer cell. There's two ways you could think of this working. One would be that you actually take this cell and you push it and push it and push it until eventually it falls off a cliff of some kind. And there is no going back. We now have a cancer cell. It's committed. It's abnormal. It's defective. The alternative is that you have a cell. It's definitely broken. There's stuff wrong with it, right? But you have to keep pushing and keep sending signals, right? You're pushing, always pushing, pushing in order to maintain the cancer phenotype. Does everyone get that? Is it like sort of all or none, or do you have to keep putting in signals? And what does this suggest? If they were transformed, but then they became untransformed when we took the signal away, is that not fairly clear? Right? They need the signal. And the fancy term for this is oncogene addiction. Okay? And that's actually, it's a major concept in cancer because people didn't know how this worked. Uh, it's always easy when you're looking back 50 years later to go, oh yeah, they're addicted. But they didn't know right, how any of this stuff works. So one of the first three papers that we're going to read deals with oncogene addiction. And, and sort of shows how it, how it was worked out. But that that is the, actually, I know I lie a lot, but that is a technical term. They actually use that term in the literature. They're called addicted to oncogenes. Okay. And SARC was not alone. So these viruses, the, the RNA viruses, turned out to be a treasure trove, a way of essentially accidentally identifying oncogenes, right? So genes which, when they're ripped out of their normal context, usually mutated, they're able to cause cancer in another cell or transformation. Uh, and so here's a bunch of them. Uh, again, you don't have to memorize these things. If I show you a bunch of gene names, you don't have to memorize gene names. There's too many of them, right? The ones that we talk about, you should know. That's it. So ABLE, uh, which we will talk about in a bit, is a kinase. Uh, it was discovered in the Abelson leukemia virus, which is, of course, where it gets its name. MYC, which is the subject of the first three papers we're going to read, right, was also discovered uh, in uh, a myeloblastosis a virus, a, a chicken virus. Okay. And as were others, including RAS, which we've uh, touched on, but we'll spend some time on RAS uh, either today or tomorrow. Okay. And remember that the viruses are not doing this on purpose. It's not a goal of a virus to pick up a, a cellular gene. Uh, they probably pick up all kinds of genes. Because one of the questions you might think is, what the hell? Why are they picking up all these oncogenes? The answer is, they're not doing that. They're picking up all kinds of genes. We only see an outcome when they pick up something that changes the behavior like this. Does that make sense? Right? Probably they're picking up glycolysis genes all the time, but so what? Everyone get that? It's not on purpose. We happen to notice it when it picks up one that causes a kind of phenotype like cancer that we're interested in. So if we can see it, right? It's a rare event. Most of the time, this, this reverse transcription, the process replication, it goes just fine. And there is none, nothing going wrong. But there are literally 10 to the whatever if big number, of virions, right? Lots and lots and lots of infections. And so it's a rare event, but the N is enormous. Okay? And the screening is pretty easy, right? If you get cancer, it's easy to identify that rare event. So that's why we see these. Okay? So what's going on with ALV? ALV doesn't carry an oncogene, but we showed, uh, or at least I showed you in the pictures, that ALV does cause cancer. It just takes a lot longer. Right? It, uh, it, it's probably less common, and it's a uh, much longer latent period. And there are a couple different ways it happens. Uh, it can either activate a gene, and that's what's demonstrated here, in which the ALV provirus, that is the integrated DNA form of this uh, retrovirus, 
if it inserts next to gene X or K or A or whatever, you just don't see it. If it happens to land near a gene that's really important and control cell division, like MYC, if the presence of this virus causes much more transcription of this than you need, then you're going to have problems. Does everyone see that? Again, unlikely event, but the outcome is visible. Right? You get, you get cancer. Okay. Why would it cause more transcription? What do viruses do for a living? They replicate. That's all they do. Right? So viruses have extremely strong promoters. Right? They, their whole job is to hijack the host cell and make copies of themselves. And the way they do that is by making tons of copies of whatever they want, right? their genes. If it happens to that, that this one by accident gets caught up in that whole thing, then you can have a problem. OK? Problem. That's my most fancy one ever. That was it. That's it for the whole semester. It's over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope the recording's working. OK. All right. Uh, and these, these viruses can also inactivate target genes, right? I mean, I, I switched the slide already, so don't read that. Right. But, but they can inactivate, right? They could land in a gene and destroy it, right? So you can either turn on a gene or off a gene by landing in the host genome, okay? Either way, you can cause problems if you hit the wrong gene, okay? So uh, I wanted to talk with, about other viruses in human cancer. So, uh, how about retroviruses in human cancer? So you know HTLV-3 as its new name, right? It was originally called HTLV-3. Now we call it HIV, right? Uh, the causative agent of AIDS. It, when it was originally described, it was HTLV-3. Uh, but HTLV-1, human T-cell leukemia or lymphoma virus type 1, was the first identified human retroviral pathogen. It was the first retrovirus that was shown to cause problems in people. And it actually carries its own oncogenes, uh, uh, which we're not going to really get into, but their function is to drive cell division because that's what viruses do. Right? Almost all viruses replicate much better, that is, reproduce themselves better, if they kick their host cell into high gear. Because that's when you're making lots of proteins, lots of ribosomes, lots of, right, metabolically, you crank up the host so you can make more of yourself. And almost all viruses will do that, right? They, they rarely replicate in quiescent or senescent cells. And so here is an example of a cutaneous lesion, a lymphoma. I told you lymphomas, even though they're blood cells, they can make masses. And in this particular case, the cells are invading in this person's cheek, right? A cutaneous or skin lymphoma. And that's just what the, the virion, virions look like, okay? How about other RNA viruses in human cancer? Hepatitis C virus. Uh, is globally a huge health burden. There are 150 million people in the world who are carriers of hepatitis C virus. And it is associated with hepatocellular carcinoma, which is abbreviated HCC. Hepato is liver. So liver cancer. And this is a long term infection, right? That's the key to this. It doesn't have the same kind of oncogenes. It's a chronic long-term infection. We're going to see this over and over again in the course. It's much better understood now than it was even a few years ago, and people are starting to address this. Long-term chronic infection, chronic inflammation. What happens when you have a, a virus living in your, in your liver cells? What's happening to the cells? What is, what is the virus doing to the cells it infects? Likely. Kill. Killing them. Okay, and so, but your liver doesn't disappear. Why? Because your liver has to constantly regenerate. For 20, 30, 40 years, your liver is reproducing, having to make tons of new cells because cells are dying. And it's doing that in the presence of an immune reaction against the virus, which is producing lots of toxic chemicals, which can cause mutations. Okay. Uh, 
It, yeah, but well, it, it is more prone if you have an infection. If in, in a normal situation, it doesn't have to reproduce itself that much. But in, infection greatly increases your risk. Yeah. Yeah. Transmission of this is by blood, uh, shared needles, things like that, IV drug users, transfusions, uh, if the blood supply is not clean, and infrequently uh, it is transmitted sexually. There was a cure developed for HCV at Emory, and you may know that, right? Um, Dennis Leota and his partners at Emory developed a drug which can cure at least 90% of people uh, in around what is it, 12 weeks, so what's 12, three months, right? Um, and so this drug was approved. Um, they sold the, they had a company, right, that they sold for $11.2 billion right, to a, a bigger company called Gilead. Um, we also bought his AIDS drug too, right? <laughs> they just renamed Gilead. And uh, so th this drug, which is called Sol Solvaldi, has an incredible success rate. It's also used in combination with another drug uh, to treat the cancer with a different name. Uh, the problem with Solvaldi is that it costs $84,000 um, for uh, 12 weeks. So that's $1,000 a pill, right? That's what it works out to. Uh, so it's an incredibly expensive drug, right? And people bitch to high heaven about this, right? Um, when you do the work, uh, I think it costs around $300 to $600 to make that amount of drug, and they sell it for $84,000, right? So it's a multi-billion dollar drug. We got hundreds of million people infected. Uh, interesting story, right? Okay. DNA viruses, viruses that have DNA as their genome also cause cancer. Uh, the one that we'll talk about, I guess, the most probably is the human papillomavirus, or HPV. Uh, and the, there are lots of HPVs, as I'll show you in a minute. The, the primary drivers of, of cervical cancer are the variants that are called HPV 16 and 18. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. But uh, it's not just uh, cervical cancer, right? People think HPV affects women, it's cervical cancer. That's not the case. Uh, it causes penile cancer. It causes over 90% of anal cancers. It's caused, there is now actually, and you'll see this word in the literature, an epidemic of oral cancers, esophageal cancers, mouth, throat cancers that are caused by HPV transmitted sexually. Okay? Um, and so uh, for those of us who don't know what the cervix is, uh, which probably some percentage of us don't know what the cervix is here, uh, it's right here. The cervix is at the junction between the uterus and the vagina. It's essentially a ring of muscle. And the, the job of the cervix is to stop the baby from falling out. Okay? Should you get pregnant, you don't want the baby falling out. Uh, right? So that's what the cervix, so it's a really strong, actually, ring of muscle. And it's right at a junction of two different types of epithelia, which is a great place for cancer. Okay? Uh, and this is what uh, cervical cancer looks like when viewed through a colposcopy, colposco however you say it, it's colposcopy, colposcope, however you say that, uh, right? Imaging tool. Okay, and just uh, to uh, once again uh, reiterate for the guys with Y's here, or people with Y's in this room, right, <laughs> uh, that it's not just cervical cancer. This actually came out today, right? So this is a new study that, was, that just went online today in JAMA Oncology, and they were associating oral uh, papilloma with incidence of head and neck cancer. Essentially, they found in here, if you kind of do the math and read the paper and whatever, a 22-fold like increased chance of oral cancers for people who test positive for HPV-16 in their oral mucosa. Right? So if you have HPV-16 in your mouth, uh, you have a 22-fold increased risk of developing uh, oral cancer. 
Now, transformation by HPV, right? That is that, that process by which a normal cell gets all those phenotypes we talked about before, right? Dividing, piling up, all right? The things that we talked about transformation is super rare event. In fact, uh, it's thought that at least 80% of all women in the U.S. will be infected with HPV in their lifetime. 80%. But there's only 30,000 cases of cervical cancer diagnosed per year, about, right, plus or minus. And what that tells us is that almost always the virus is cleared. It turns out that most women, the vast majority of women, will clear the infection within two years, right? Uh, the people who have problems, who have, are at risk of developing the cancer, are people who retain the virus in their cells for a long time. Okay? And this is what happens. So again, transformation isn't ra is rare. It's not part of the normal viral life cycle. The virus doesn't want to cause cancer. It has nothing to do. It doesn't help the virus in any way. Right? Uh, in fact, we'll see it. It really doesn't. But what happens is that the virus integrates, right? This is a DNA genome. It's circular. Uh, but it can integrate into the genome. And when it integrates, it inactivates this gene, E2, which regulates the oncogenes, which are E6 and E7. And these we will see again. Um, so uh, do, well, I need a marker. We'll, we'll add E6 and E7 to our map, right? But the, the protein produced by this gene, E6, destroys indirectly P53, this tumor suppressor right here. Right? P53 is, is right there in the middle of the map. P53 is probably the most important tumor suppressor. And essentially, all viruses have to bypass it some way. Um, E6 destroys that. E7 takes out RB, right? Another tumor suppressor. So these two tumor suppressors are inactivated by E6 and E7, genes that are brought in. These are viral genes, not like SARC in the other system, right? These are part of the genome, normal genes for this virus. Everyone see the difference? And HPV integrates, and these genes produce proteins, which inactivate tumor suppressors. Why would you do that if you're a virus? We just said. Why, if you're a virus, why would you carry genes that stop tumor suppressors? Because those genes are stopping the cell cycle. Your goal as a virus is to crank it up, right? So the viruses have those for their own purposes, right? It's only in the rare event when it integrates and stays that you have problems. And this is what happens. Uh, you, you, the way uh, that, that uh, someone gets infected with HPV is that there has to be a small crack uh, or injury in the surface of the epithelium. But everyone has micro abrasions, right? Teeny little uh, abrasions on the surface of their skin. And so the virus actually falls down to the bottom, which is why you see the colors starting down at the bottom. You think it would be infection, it would be in the top, right? But they have to fall down to these layers down here. And the, at first, everything looks okay, and you essentially start to get dysplasia. You get less and less of the virus made, that is the late proteins, more and more of just E6 and E7, right? Those oncogenes that are going to turn off this. So really, the virus isn't even making virus anymore. At the point when a woman or a, a man, whatever, has cancer caused by this, it's not really making virus much at all. Mostly what's happening is that you're expressing these oncogenes in the cells. Yeah. Well, I said most women clear it in less okay. in two years or less. Okay. Yeah. If someone is developing cancer or have cancer that infected with HPV, then if you already have cancer or develop and then you and then you add that in top of it. Don't know. Don't know. I don't know that anyone's look, looked at that. I don't know. I don't know. It can't be good. <laughs> I wouldn't think it would be great, but, but I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it would help. Maybe it would kill the infected cells. I mean, the, the affected cells. Yeah. 
I mean, what would happen is you would get you would get lots of this uh, DNA and yellow. It would be it would be transient, and you shed lots of virus, and then you go away because the immune system clear clears it eventually. But this is a sustained, long-term thing in which the the cells are replicating because of the presence of E6 and E7. And you get uh, what's called SIN. It's cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Neo means new, plasia is growth. Intraepithelial, within the epithelial. Pretty well named, right? right. So it grows and it, and it progresses from SIN1 to SIN2, and then again into SIN3, in which all of the epithelium is involved. Yes? It's the integration, which is not a. It's the it's the right. integration of the of that circular DNA. Uh -huh. When this integrates, which isn't a norm necessarily normal for it to stay integrated, right? To go in and stay in. When it integrates, it integrates here, and this is a regulatory gene for those, and so it destroys the regulation. So that that's what leads to the problem. Is everyone? Right? So normally that wouldn't happen. So E2 is a good guy, essentially, right? And E6 and E7 are not. Okay? Now, it's, it is good to know, right, that, that, that sin, even all the way up to sin 3, it can regress uh, and not lead to cancer. So this can be detected by pap smears, right, where they take a small swab of cells from the cervix and look at them under a microscope. Um, and they'll, um, they'll watch this or whatever. Nowadays, they can actually do testing for the virus itself. They do DNA testing uh, for the virus. Okay. But th this can revert. Okay. So why do some people, even those that have the uh, integration, some of them probably don't get infected and some do. And there are a couple different factors in this. One is the subtype. So there are, it turns out, this, of course, you do have to memorize. Uh, no. There are a ton of, of viral subtypes, right? There's at least 100 different kinds of HPV. Uh, and here is a, essentially a relationship tree of those, a cladogram, right, showing the, the relationship of those. HPV 16 and 18 belong to groups that are called high risk. Uh, they, they're, they're, for whatever reason, their form of E6, E7, their genome, their, their genome makes them much more likely to cause cancer. About 70% of cancers are caused by those two in, in humans. Right. So the subtype is really important. How much virus you have, uh, it is, of course, possible to be infected by more than one subtype at the same time. That may matter, right? Uh, immunological factors, and then, and of course, just general genetic susceptibility, right, which we, is a vague junk heap, right, but we know we're all different, and so you may react for whatever reason differently to infection, right. Uh, uh, in the vaccine, Gardasil, right, which hopefully all of you are like, oh yeah, been there, done that, right, Gardasil. Um, uh, this was approved in 2006. It contains four different subtypes. It has 16 and 18, which are the, the two high-risk ones that, that I mentioned that, that produce about 70% of cancer. 6 and 11, uh, which are here and wherever, here's 11, those two are also in Gardasil. They don't actually cause cancer. They cause genital warts. They toss those in as a bonus, right? Okay, because uh, genital wars are just ugly, right? So they put them in there for you, okay? So uh, all four of them are in there. There is a competing vaccine called Cervarex, which is, has only 16 and 18 in it. Uh, in 2014, so about two years ago, uh, there was a new version of Gardasil approved called Gardasil 9, in which this now covers, I think, and I don't know for sure, they added in more of the uh, high-risk subtypes in that one, and I, I'm not exactly sure if it's 95 or 99 percent of all cervical cancer now is covered by the vaccine, uh, but, but it's very high, right? And then last month, not forgetting the guys here, who gives it to girls? 
mostly guys, right? All right. So uh, the FDA actually approved their male age indication for nine through 26. Anyone in here older than 26, other than me? Means you can all get it. Okay. Uh, so if <laughs> so, if you're a male who has not gotten it, you can now. And there's no reason not to, right? No, no excuse uh, not to get the vaccine, right? Okay. Uh, people think uh, that that getting the vaccine when you're talking, especially in in not always in the U.S. or not in all cultures within the U.S., but it's certainly in some cultures, there's a lot of resistance to. Uh, getting young women, in particular, vaccinated, right? Because people think that it will make their, their daughters promiscuous, right? Oh, if I'm giving her the vaccine, that's pretty much a green light to just go out and do whatever she wants sexually, right? And uh, the, they've actually done a lot of studies on that. Because of that exact thing, we know what we're up against, right? And the studies show uh, that, in fact, it does not change people's activity at all. Right? So, so young women who were going to be sexually active are sexually active. Those that aren't, aren't. And getting vaccinated does not make people more likely to engage in anything they weren't already doing or weren't going to do. Okay? So if you deal with friends or family or anything right, who have children, please talk with them. Right? This is, this, there's no reason for anyone to get cervical cancer. It's ridiculous. Right? It's a silly thing. Right? And we were interviewing someone for our website who had it. She was a veterinarian. She was probably 30, and she died a couple days after we interviewed her. And we couldn't really interview her because she was on morphine. Okay? And that's no reason for that now. Right? Uh, so now, there is some thinking, right, that, that HPV transmission can actually be influenced uh, by essentially environmental factors, right? Uh, that is that, that grooming of pubic hair by both men and women, right, which is extremely common, right? You know this. It's probably not a class about this, but you know this, right? <laughs> okay. uh, the thinking is that that doing that could really open you up to infections that you would otherwise not uh, get. Um, because there is essentially no way that someone could groom their genitals without leaving microabrasions. And how did we say HPV gets in? <laughs> microabrasions. Okay? It's not possible. Right? So, uh, anyway, just thought I'd point that out. Okay. Now, more DNA viruses and cancer. Okay? Uh, the hepatinaviruses, which I colored so you can see the name, right? HEPA DNA viruses. These are viruses that cause hepatitis, liver, liver disease. Okay? Hepatitis B virus is the one. It's transmitted by blood. Chronic infection gives you a hundredfold increase in hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay? Um, uh, there are regulator proteins. It does cause chronic inflammation, and, and probably because it does insert, uh, you can get insertional mutagenesis, like ALV, right? Same kind of thing, right? If it plops in next to something, it can cause problems. So there's multiple uh, ways that this hepatitis works. The polyomaviruses, uh, uh, in, including SV40, the simian uh, vacuolizing virus 40, name because it was the 40th one they found, right? SV40. It actually doesn't cause tumors in its natural host, which is a monkey, simian, right? Monkey, simian, simian virus. So uh, it doesn't cause tumors there, but if you abort the infection, it can lead to transformation. So I put it on, on our slides, even though it doesn't cause human cancer for, uh, or at least it's certainly not thought to cause human cancer for several reasons. One is that uh, there is a protein that simian virus 40 makes called large T antigen, and it's so cool it's on the map. It's hard to make the map, right? So here's large T. This LT right here in the middle is large T antigen. 
And like the, the adenoviral proteins, E6 and E7, large T takes out at P53 and RB. It's a single protein that does both. See, it's a badass protein. That's how you get to be on the map, right? So, so large T takes out both of the tumor, suprotein, tumor suppressors, P53 and RB. Yeah? Uh, what does it mean by aborting the infection? An aborted infection is if you put a virus into a different cell type. So in monkeys, it goes all the way through and it makes progeny. You get virions. But you can take some viruses, and if you put that same virus into a human cell, it doesn't have everything it needs to make a virus, so it goes so far and then it stops or aborts. Right? And that's a great question. I should have actually said that. Did everyone hear the answer to that? Right? So an aborted infection is it go, the, the virus can get into the cell, but it can't make progeny. Right? That's a great, great question. Right. There, there is another uh, a protein called small t, which also comes from here. Small t is right here on the map, and we'll see it later. We're going to see both large t, small t. That's probably why I'm spending time on this. Right. Another reason that SV40 is of human interest is that back in the days when polio was being eradicated, Right? When people were taking the Salk and Sabin polio vaccines, everyone's heard of polio, right? Okay. So right, the polio vaccine, they grew up the polio virus in monkey cells. And after they had given it to millions and millions and millions of people, they went, oops, it turns out that it was, these cells were infected with SV40. Gosh, I hope that doesn't cause problems. Right, uh, And all the indication, all the evidence is that SV40, which did get in all those people probably, right, uh, was also probably given to those people because those viruses were live viruses. Right? I mean, the, the vaccine, I mean, right, was a live vaccine. Probably uh, they inoculated a whole bunch of the American public with uh, SV40. It doesn't seem to have caused cancer in humans. Okay. Here's the, the new kid on the block. This, this is a, a cancer-causing virus, finally, right? One that was discovered during your lifetime, right? So, so, so 2008, right, this virus was discovered. And it's, it's a polyomavirus, and it's associated with a skin cancer called human Mer Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, and it was the first human pathogen ever discovered purely by genomic analysis, which is interesting. Right? So they didn't know a disease, they weren't looking, they actually were doing a genetic analysis, sequencing, and they said, hey, wait, what's this? Okay? Uh, and that's Merkel cell. It is thought to be the causative agent of this rare, uh, but it can be aggressive form of, of skin cancer. It encodes a T antigen, it is a polyomavirus like SV40, so it does have a T antigen uh, that makes several proteins uh, by alternative splicing. Uh, in case you don't know what a Merkel cell is, this is what a Merkel cell looks like, although I don't know if the color is accurate. Um, they are sensory cells. They are involved in light touch sensing in the skin. And when this cell uh, becomes cancerous, uh, then you can get Merkel cell carcinoma that looks like that. Okay. Adenoviruses. Uh, are not transforming in the natural host. Thankfully, we are the natural host, so that means they don't cause cancer in humans. Okay? Uh, they do make uh, proteins, in this case, like HPV, they make one called E1A that binds to and inactivates RB, and E1B that binds to and inactivates P53. Everyone sees a theme here, yes? P53 and RB must be pretty darn important, right, in controlling cell division and cell death. Okay. And all of these viruses have developed a way to, to get around that. Okay. Uh, herpes viruses. Right? You are familiar, I'm sure, with uh, herpes simplex virus, uh, which causes cold sores and, and can cause genital lesions, uh, either H HSV1 or 2. But Epstein-Barr virus was the first human tumor virus, right? This was the first one in which people actually looked in patients, in people, 
and found that this stuff causes cancer. So in 1964, right, this is when uh, Epstein and Barr showed that this virus could be obtained from people with Burkitt's lymphoma, a cancer that is found at high incidences in Africa, which we'll talk about in a second. So uh, this is the lymphoma, right? Again, a large solid mass, uh, in, again on the face in this particular case, although they can occur other places, right? Uh, here, here it is in the, for this child. It, it's associated with other lymphomas, with nasopharyngeal carcinoma, maybe gastric cancer. Um, and it does seem to have uh, an oncogene, which is called the latent membrane protein, which alters gene expression. And uh, it does so by altering the activity of a nasty gene that we'll talk about several times in the course called nuclear factor kappa B, NF kappa B. Uh, so it does carry an oncogene. Uh, that that uh, it's not just like inflammation or something, right? Question. Yeah. Um, are, are, are both or the simplexes all um, really all mixed use and equally unsuccessful? Hmm? The different simplexes? The herpes simplex viruses don't cause cancer that, that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah. But this, this one does. It's the same, it's, it's a herpes virus, but it's not HSV1 or 2. It's a different kind. Herpes virus is a big group of viruses. Yeah. So uh, there's an interesting sort of epidemiology to, to Burkitt's lymphoma. And it seems to be that it overlaps uh, very much so with malaria infections. So if you go to Africa where there's a lot of malaria, there's tons of EBV. And it's thought that almost all children are infected with EBV during their lifetime. So why do only some of them get Burkitt's lymphoma, right, if, if that's the cause? Why, why is it so really relatively low? It's thought that it may be due to like an interplay between the malarial infection and EBV both. Uh, so malaria results in polyclonal, that is lots of different B cells become activated and start to divide, polyclonal activation, lots of different B cells. Right? And that activation increases the chances of CMYK, the oncogene that we're going to talk about, right? MYK is here. Right? There's MYK. Right? Uh, it increases the chance that there will be a translocation, an activating translocation in MYK. Uh, EBV infection of the B cells in which a translocation has taken place causes autonomous growth of the cell. So it's a combination of the EBV genes and MYC being turned on right, in the same cells. And it's also thought that malaria in causes immunosuppression that makes it harder to recognize the infected cells, right, the EBV infected cells. Yeah? I mean, if you have chronic infection recurrent long term, it wouldn't be short. So what, what they've studied is malaria. It makes sense that it could be other things as well would, would, would matter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, another herpes virus called HHV8, the human herpes virus 8, or Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. This is what you see in AIDS patients. Uh, so these people are very immunosuppressed, and in people who are immunosuppressed, they will develop uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, a cancer uh, that uh, affects essentially only those people. You don't see this happen in, in a healthy person right, with, a, with a functioning immune system. So the virus, if you get rid of the immune system, is able to cause transformation and cancer development. Okay. Pox viruses. Pox viruses. Uh, they cause benign growths that often regress. You've heard of pox, like smallpox, right? Pox viruses, right? And the examples of these are the Yaba monkey virus and Shope sarcoma virus, which affect a different species of animals. And mostly I'm telling you about this because the picture is so good. 
look at that, right? So this is this is the weird, bizarro growths, right? These benign growths. Again, they're large, but they don't spread. They don't impede organs. They're benign. Right? They arise in that area. They stay in that area. They don't go to the brain, the lungs, etc. Everyone knows that what that means now. And uh, so this is what it looks like. And the thinking is actually that, that this virus is probably the origin for the term jackalopes, which you all have, probably, I've seen that. Who has seen jackalope? OK, that's, it's worth it just for you guys. OK, yeah. So, so jackalope, right? Like the whole combination thing probably was, was what happened when these viruses infected rabbits, right? and made rabbits that looked like they had horns. OK, so why do viruses do this? Uh, it's absolutely an accident. Um, it, it's definitely not on purpose. There's really no advantage to the virus. It doesn't make them make more virions. It doesn't really get more people infected. It doesn't do anything from an evolutionary perspective that would help the virus. Right? So it's an accident. But it's thought to be about 15 to 20 percent of all cancers. Right? And there are vaccines against hepatitis B and against HPV, right? right. So uh, the transforming host is really, it's not going to help. The transformed cells almost always stop producing virus. They're just essentially making the transforming uh, genes and things like that. Um, and uh, again, what the, the reason for these, the presence of these genes is to drive the cells into mitosis. They want to block infected cells from dying until they've made more product, more viruses. Right? So they put the brakes on P53 and RB, who are going to do block mitosis, drive death. Okay? And they can actually uh, help to uh, prevent recognition of cells that are defective. All right. Other infectious agents and cancer. Uh, the first one is H. pylori. So stomach cancer is actually relatively uncommon in the US. But globally, it's 8% of all cancers. And I showed you how big those numbers were on the first day. So 8% times 15 million. That's a lot of people. Right? And about half, half of the world's population is infected with H. pylori. Right? Helicobacter pylori uh, is this organism right here. It's a bacterium. Uh, it does, in fact, insert proteins into cells that line the, the stomach where it lives. It lives in a super low pH, right? Stomach has a pH of like one or something, right? And these bacteria are like no prob, right? Uh, and they will inject the, the neighboring cells with things that probably cause deregulation. They do it to protect themselves but it probably hurts the cells right? associated with stomach cancer. Right? Schistosomes. Schistosomes is something that people in the US are really probably very unfamiliar with. Uh, these are a, a parasite. It's a blood-borne parasite. It'll wedge in small venules. It can go into the bladder, the colon, whatever. Uh, and it, it affects around 200 million people across the world. 200 million, right? The US only has 300 million. It'll have less maybe after the election. We'll see. But, 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 but two, two, right? 200 million people, right, are uh, infected with this. Um, and uh, it's thought that schistosomes are, it, they cause bladder cancer. They are probably a causative agent of uh, schistosomiasis, is the infection. That's the term for when you're infected. And they think it probably causes colorectal cancer, too. And again, this is a chronic, long-term infection. And what happens is that the schistosomes release eggs continuously. And those eggs cause a potent immune response. So this is an adenoma, which is a benign growth, a polyp, which is a protrusion from a flat area. That's a polyp. Right? If you have something that sticks out into a hollow area, it's a polyp. So here is a polyp or an adenoma, an abnormal growth in the colon that was caused because of infection with this organism. And these dark things in here are actually like calcified eggs. 
So it doesn't seem to be the organism per se that's causing the problem. It seems to be the constant immune response to the, to the eggs. Right? They're, they're very irritating to the immune system, and it's this constant inflammation caused by that that, that, that leads to the issue. And for those of you who don't know schistosome or parasite biology, it's, it's actually pretty interesting. The fat critter here, this one, is the male. And you see there's like a light area here. You see there's like a groove. Yeah? You see like right here? It looks like a fold in the picture. It's a groove. The female lives in there forever. Right? Very close relationship. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so she goes in there, and actually they don't even develop sexually until they're together like that. And then once she's in there, she stays there forever. There is no getting rid of her. Okay. Right. okay. Other infectious agents uh, and, uh, and cancer. Liver flukes. Again, something that is not so common here in the U.S., but it's actually relatively common in Asia and other places. So here is a liver fluke, right? a small uh, parasite. This is how you get it from eating something that looks like that. Mmm, right? So this is a raw fish dish uh, that can be contaminated with the parasites, and then that gets into you and gets into your liver. And essentially, it, 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 by, it produces a protein called granulin, which acts like a hormone. And not only is the fluke itself irritating and causing inflammation, but it's actually producing something that forces cell division. Right. So again, long-term inflammation, cell division, problem. See, cancer biology is pretty simple, isn't it? The colonic bacteria, which are colored exactly like that. Um, we have more bacteria in us and on us than we have our own cells. You all know that. We have about 10 times more in us and on us than we actually have of our own cells. And the colonic bacteria are absolutely tied to all kinds of things. Everything from your mood. It's amazing. Uh, depression, risk of eye infection. I mean, it just comes out every week. There's some kind of cool things that your, that your gut microbiome, as it's called, right, that collection, actually regulates in your body. And, but the colonic bacteria are tightly tied to colon cancer, right? People who have irritable bowel disease, Crohn's disease, um, have chronic inflammation uh, in their gut or have skewed bacterial populations in their gut are at, at elevated risk of getting those cancers. And, of course, there are probably uh, others, okay? All right. So now we're done Tuesday. See, I shouldn't have said anything, right? It would be so much faster if I just click through these. Uh-huh. All right. All right, go ahead, stretch. You want to stretch? Go ahead, everybody stretch. Uh, this is quick, quick. Yeah, it's quick stretch. Ugh. Okay. All right. We good? All right. Oncogenes. So, this woman, this actually really looks like something that came from the onion. Okay? But I promise you, I so didn't believe it that I looked it up. Right? It's real. This woman is standing outside her house. She said she's worried about the effect of her, on her unburned child from the sound of jackhammers. You see they're doing construction. Right? So, and she's sitting there smoking as they're taking the picture, okay? I was like, the only thing, here we go. Just give her that, and we're good to go, right? Just, okay. Right? So we're going to now talk about oncogenes, right? And how do you take a normal happy gene and turn it into one that's going to cause cancer, okay? And just in case you thought you were safe, okay, uh, this guy just looks like he's so peace, at peace though, right? <laughs> he's so happy. Right? Before you vape, vaping is bad for you. But don't even get me started on hookah, okay? People think hookah's good because it tastes like cherries or something, right? 
One hour of hookah is like smoking a hundred cigarettes. Okay. Take that with you when you go to Toko. Okay. I see you there worried about your hookah consumption. <laughs> You're not alone. You are not alone. Okay. Really bad for you. The first Anka genes, right? The first Anka genes were the ones that we talked about already, the retroviral Anka genes, right? And uh, the, identif the identification of Anka genes was driven by advances in technology that we could take DNA from one organism and put it into another, uh, either the same organism or a different one. And so you learned about this, 1940s, Avery McCardin McLeody, right? Who, uh, uh, who, um, McCarty and McLeod, sorry. Uh, who transfected, put DNA into bacteria, right? Uh, in the 70s, Hill and Hillova were put DNA from RSV transformed cells into chick embryo fibroblasts. What do you think is going to happen? So you take transformed cells and you put it into chick embryo fibroblasts. What's going to happen to those fibroblasts? Yeah. But it's not like an embryo, it's just fibroblasts, right? So, so right, it's, it's not an embryo, that it's just fibroblasts. So what would you expect would happen to the fibroblasts if we put transformed DNA, and we already know what's in there in RSV. What's going to happen? Well, it's just, they're, they're in culture. So you can't get cancer because it can't spread. It can't leave the dish. It's tough. Right? Yeah, I mean, what they got was essentially transformation, right? They said, okay, we can take DNA and we can transform it, right? They also got virus back out, okay? Um, uh, the refinements of that showed that really it was only SARC that was necessary to do this. In, in 1980, 79 and 80, Robert Weinberg, right, the author of the Hallmarks paper that you read, right, and the author of another paper you're going to read, <coughs> Right? He took DNA from chemically transformed or normal cells and transfected that into NIH 3T3 cells. So NIH 3T3 cells are mouse cells. They're immortalized, but they're not transformed. So it's a stepwise thing. Immortalized means they will divide forever, but these cells don't pile up and form colonies and foci like transformed cells do. Right? They're not normal but they're not as abnormal. And they found that if you took chemically transformed DNA and you put it into recipients, you got tons of foci. Transformation was occurring. If you then take those and retransfer them again and again and again, depending how many times you want to do it, you would continuously get more transformed foci. Right? So this was a, a stable thing that could be, in, that, that could be passed down uh, from uh, cell to cell, and it was occurring in chemically transformed cells. How's that different from what we saw before? What did we look at before? How were the cells transformed? It was a virus, right? It was a viral thing. Right? So this is this is showing this that this could happen with chemically transformed cells. Then he did the control experiment, of course, which is to take normal DNA, cell, DNA from cells that hadn't been chemically altered, and he put that on to normal cells, and rarely, but once in a while, he would actually get foci, right? He would get transformation, and then he could then take those and propagate that, right? Once you had those, uh, that defect. And so his conclusion was that chemically transformed cells contain activated oncogenes, and that normal cells these cells also contained oncogenes, but they weren't active. They were proto-oncogenes, right? And that somehow the normal cell in this process, remember, this is your alt, you're extracting this DNA, you're purifying it, it's getting broken, it's probably getting chemically altered, right? You're causing mutations in the process. You could cause a proto-oncogene to become an oncogene. So this was actually a big thing, right? Normal cells have the ability to do this, right? And he also showed, sort of obviously, is that cellular oncogenes could be detected by transfection. 
Okay? You could just take DNA, put it in, and then eventually whittle down and say, what gene is it that's causing the, the problem? And in 81, a guy named Jeffrey Cooper and Weinberg, independently, they both did it, right, separately, without, they weren't working together, but they both uh, transferred human DNA from a bladder carcinoma, EJ, probably the initials of the patient, most likely, and they put those into NIH 3T3 cells. So they had a human bladder carcinoma cells, they got DNA out, they put it into a mouse cell, lo and behold, they got transformation. So this shows that human tumors from actual patients contain the same kind of changes. And it also showed us that human oncogenes work in mouse cells. Okay. Okay. So human DNA had sequences that could be activated experimentally, that is chemically, uh, human tumor DNA could transform immortal cells, that is, these 3T3 cells, right? Were these genes related to the proto-oncogenes that were found in the viruses, right? At this point, we don't know. We just know that if we dump DNA on, we can get changes. But are they the same thing that we identified when we looked at all of these retroviruses? And so in 82, Weinberg and a bunch of other folks identified the first human oncogene from EJ, from that bladder, from that human cell line, and it turned out to be the cellular version of RASH, the oncogene that was identified from the Harvey sarcoma line. RASH is for Harvey. Okay. So they showed that the human tumor had a change in the same gene that was causing tumors when it was carried by a virus. Does everyone see that? Okay. RASK was identified shortly thereafter in a human lung. Uh, it was a homologue of another uh, oncogene found in a virus called the Kirsten sarcoma. That's where the K comes from. And RASN was identified in 1983 from a neuroblastoma. So N for neuroblastoma. And so this was actually, it, it doesn't seem like a big deal maybe to you now, but at the time it was a huge breakthrough because there were people that were working with viruses and they were saying, oh, it was viruses, viral oncogenes, right? It was the virus camp versus the chemical camp. And everyone was saying, we're right, we're right. What these results showed was that they're both right, right? It united those fields and said, we're all talking about the same thing. So it actually was a big deal as far as getting people to work together and actually start to reevaluate the people that were the gene jockeys that were looking in DNA were saying, oh, the virus stuff was not important. Then they said, oh, wait, it's the same. So they could go back and start reevaluating re some of that stuff. Okay. So what's the deal with RAS? RAS is, is right here. Right? Here's RAS. We'll clearly we'll talk about it. Paper starting with paper one. Okay. Uh, pro, yeah, I think so. But definitely two. Right? Here's RAS. RAS is an oncogene or proto-oncogene. The, the oncogene, the protein is uh, or the gene is defective in at least 40% of all cancers of any origin. Okay? So again, just like P53 and RB are important tumor suppressors, this thing is mutated in almost half of all cancers. Okay? So RAS is one that we're going to talk about. The comparison of the normal version of this gene RAS and the mutant version showed that a single missense mutation was sufficient to cause it to become an oncogene from a proto-oncogene. So here's the change. Uh, if, you, if you look at the protein of, of normal RAS H, this is what it looks like. If you look at the EJ RAS, it looks like that, right? You just have a glycine turn into a valine, okay? So you essentially, you just put a couple uh, um, methyl groups here, uh, right? Three, three carbon, that's it. Right? And you go from a gene that's working fine to one that is an oncogene. Everybody see that? Okay.
So the nomenclature for this, you will see in papers, and you should just be familiar with it. It's not something I'm going to grill you on. I'm not going to trick you or anything. It's just you're going to see it, so learn what it means. Okay? Here is the nomenclature. You would call this in a paper, you would say it's HRAS, right? Harvey sarcoma RAS, that variant. There's more than one gene, right? HRAS, and we turn a G at position 12 into a V. Glycine to valine. This is the way that the nomenclature is. This is the way it is in your papers. Does everyone get that? It tells you the specific activating change in the oncogene. Okay, and I know you're going to see it in the papers. I'm just trying to flatten the curve out. Yeah? Is it always that 12th position? No. That's just for that one. No, and it, it certainly any, could be. Any they're all the. No, no, no. No, no, position more important than amino acid. Yeah, it's, it's where it is more than the, yeah. Okay, and what does RAS do? RAS, again, is right here, and it functions in signal transduction, and we'll talk about it, right? We'll go into it in some detail, but we'll move on for now. We'll come back to RAS, okay? Uh, but it's an important uh, signal transducing protein. So what do the proto-oncogenes do? The very first oncogene that was actually linked with a function is called cis, and it's V cis, which means it was isolated where? V for virus, yeah. So V cis, this was another viral oncogene, and it, they found out that it was actually derived from part of a growth factor, the PDGF, the platelet-derived growth factor, right? The B chain, right? The beta chain of that growth factor. Okay. A bunch of other growth factors subsequently have been shown to be Oncogenes. And that makes sense, right? You have too much growth factor, the cells could grow more than they should, right? It makes sense. So fibroblast growth factor went, which is up here on our pathway, uh, the epidermal growth factor, transforming growth factor, and some of the, the molecules that are uh, communication for the immune system, the interleukins. Leuco is, I said, white. Interleukin, between white blood cells. Interleukin, that's what those things do. Interleukin. Okay? So these are signaling molecules in the immune system. Okay? So here's the growth factor receptors. Essentially, when you know that what you're interested in is the gas system, right? The accelerator system of a car. You can start out with the factor, and you work your way all the way down through the whole system. If you knew a car, which I don't, you could do that whole thing, right? You go from the, I mean, I know you, you, this foot goes faster, right? <laughs> but growth factor receptors, they're on the surface of the cells. They act as antennae. They receive signals. They bind extracellular ligands. Almost all of them that we're interested in, not all of them, but almost all of them are protein kinases. Okay? And they look like this. They have an outside part. This is what's doing the binding. And then inside, they all have kinase domains. Most, oops, most, oops, dang. Most of them, tyrosine kinases. Most of them are tyrosine kinases, right? The really important signaling kinases tend to be tyrosine kinases. Okay? How does binding out here cause changes in cell behavior? Have you had signaling? What happens? Yeah? So there's a... So he said there's a huge cascade of stuff, right? It phosphorylates and phosphorylates. How do you get a signal from outside the cell to do anything inside the cell? How does the inside of the cell know there's anything out there? How does it know? It is a receptor. So now I plunk something down here. So what? Change in conformation, right? So that's what happens, right? Is that, is that when something binds out here, almost always it causes a dimerization, uh, of the receptor, that is, it brings two together, dimers two. It brings two together, that causes a conformational change, or it brings together domains uh, such that they can activate each other. 
Very often, these things will auto-phosphorylate, self-phosphorylate, right, in order to drive signals. So this one phosphorylates that one, that one phosphorylates that one, and we're off and running. Okay? They're brought together by virtue of the binding on the outside. Does everyone get that or had that, been there, done that? Okay. And then you can activate translation factors, you can activate other kinases, oops, dang, I'm having some problems with this. Sorry. You can uh, activate transcription factors. You can have delayed things so that you get more transcription later, right? But no matter what, you get a cascade. So if this, if this receptor is jammed in the on position, which is what happens, Right? It no longer needs that ligand out there, right? It has a mutation that makes it look like it's out there, right? Now you're in trouble, right? Now you get signaling continuously when you only wanted to have it once in a while. Does everyone, that make sense? Okay. Okay. So there are other oncogenes, right? They serve as non-receptor protein tyrosine kinases, of which we already met SARC. ABL, which we will meet later, is another one of those. Uh, there are receptors that are associated with non-receptor protein tyrosine kinases, i.e. someone has to stick to that. Right? So the interaction. Uh, you can have cytoplasmic kinases. They're inside the cell like this. Here's RAS. Here's RAS's best friend, RAF, right? Right downstream, right? They're not a day go by that those guys don't like hit each other up, right? All the time, they're always, right, talking, right? So RAS, RAF, RAF is, uh, RAS is in the membrane. We're gonna talk about it in detail, but RAF is right there waiting in the, inside the cell. So you can be a cytoplasmic kinase. Most of them are serine threonine kinases, right? You can be a non-receptor I mean a non-kinase, I'm sorry, a non-kinase receptor, you don't have to be a kinase, you just have to send signals, right? Uh, or you can be a transcription factor, and MYC is our transcription factor right here that we're going to focus on. Uh, the first three papers that you're going to read for presentations all deal with MYC, okay? So my thinking was let's understand one better than to do a different one each time, right? So MYC is a transcription factor. Uh, another example of a transcription factor that causes problems is the estrogen receptor. Obviously, it can cause problems. It is a, a problem in breast cancer. And nuclear factor kappa B, the same one I mentioned before. Uh, that particular transcription factor tends, tends to cause cells to live, and it causes inflammation. So survival and inflammation is a bad combination. Right? So uh, MYC, right, or quick MYC, right? Very quickly, we're going to go over what MYC does. It is a transcription factor, but it doesn't work by itself. It only binds to targets as a heterodimer. Hetero, different, dimer, two. There must be two different proteins stuck together in order for it to work. So the partner that MYC works with is MAX. MAX doesn't have a transactivating domain, right? It can't itself call in the polymerase. Does everyone know what transcription factors do? Ultimately, their goal is to recruit the RNA polymerase, right? You want to cause transcription. That's what transcription factors do. So MYC is able to do that. MAX can't do it by itself, but it helps MYC do it, okay, by binding. So MYC will actually cause alterations by attracting histone acetyltransferases, opening up uh, the DNA. MAX can form homodimers that actually compete. So it has feedback regulation, right? It, this, this is a, a tightly regulated. And MAX has another partner called MAD. And of course, it's not a coincidence, MAD MAX, okay? They knew that. Okay, uh, so, so MAD and MAX can bind together and that actually represses things, right? Histone deacetylases. So it's a self-regulating group of three proteins. Yeah? So does MAD, uh, 
sorry, but does MIC com uh, compete with Max to bind with? Yeah, so Max is there all the time. And when MIC goes up, then it can bind to Max. It will compete for binding with MAD. MAD and MIC comp com compete okay. for binding to Max. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so easy, right? The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.